Um, John Ziegler is with us this morning. Always a pleasure. Good morning, John. Good morning to you. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. Uh, always uh, appreciate it. And, John, I guess let's uh, just start with with your latest article. I did get a chance to read through it last night, and it is it is just fascinating uh, the way this thing continues to unfold. And I, I guess just uh, give us your latest and, and uh, let folks know a little bit about the, what they can find at framingbaterno.com now. Yeah, the... Uh the most recent column I've written, I, I agree with you, Jeff, it is fascinating. Um, it deals with the uh, issue of this brand new movie slash documentary that debuted at the Sundance Film Festival called Happy Valley, which I'm sure most of your listeners were at least aware of because it got a lot of publicity because it somehow stars Matt Sandusky. Um, and I, uh, as you'll see in this article, I have quite a history with this movie. I actually interviewed to direct it about two years ago, and have met with the, the makers of this movie on multiple occasions, spoke to them during the process of the production. They actually asked for my Jerry Sandusky interview from prison last year. I gave them the transcript, and then they, they lost interest because I guess it didn't tell the story that they wanted to tell. <laughs> and um, I have a full report in there about what the movie is and is not about. It's really extraordinary who they put in the movie, who they edited out of the movie. They had one of the most important people in this entire story, who I would say is on our side, uh, they did two interviews with that person. They edited them out completely after telling them that the movie might be uh, focused on their exoneration, and yet they somehow starred Matt Sandusky, who, of course, uh, as you well know, and many of your listeners do, uh, famously changed his name. He was the former adopted son of, of Jerry and Dottie Sandusky, uh, he's now known as Matt Davidson, except, I guess, when it comes to uh, promoting movies. I guess uh, Sandusky is now his stage name. And to me, uh, your listeners, the people of State College, ought to be absolutely positively outraged by both the theme of the Happy Valley movie, which is that Happy Valley knew that there was an open secret that Jerry Sandusky was a pedophile and either looked the other way and or covered it up, and that Matt Sandusky, of all people, or Matt Davidson, as he's now known, uh, is the star of this movie. Because I'm sure of, I'm sure of a few things in this story. As you know, Jeff, I've studied it incredibly closely now for over two years. One of the things I'm most positive of is that Matt Sandusky, or Matt Davidson, is currently lying. I, I do not believe that there's any shred of evidence whatsoever, any shred of rationality, that he was abused by Jerry Sandusky. And the movie does not even mention the very obvious and startling fact that Matt Sandusky testified in front of the grand jury under oath that he was never abused by Jerry Sandusky and that he had reason to believe the accusers were lying. Uh, in fact, he felt so strongly about that that he wanted to hold a press conference after his grand jury appearance, but he was dissuaded at the last minute from by his attorney at that time. The reality is that Matt Sandusky flipped in the middle of the trial using repressed memory therapy, which is completely debunked in legal circles. And um, the anecdotal and, and, I believe, circumstantial and logical evidence all indicates that his flip was motivated purely by him wanting to be on the winning side, him wanting to make sure uh, that he, he didn't uh, lose out on his meal ticket here, uh, making sure that he ended up uh, getting paid a lot of money. In fact, he told people that uh, he could pull this off, and that's exactly what he did. And now Hollywood is making him into a hero at the expense, further expense, of the reputation of State College and so-called Happy Valley, and I believe it's outrageous. And I tried to write about this in the Center Daily Times. I have an extraordinary email exchange in there with the editor of the Center Daily Times. They had asked for uh, my uh, article about this because I went to prison last week to meet with Jerry and Dottie and speak to them about this. Uh, they, they wanted the article. I gave it to them under extraordinary circumstances. And it's very clear when you read the email exchange that um, the standard that they wanted to set for, for telling the real truth of this story um, was so high that there was no way that it was ever going to happen. And that just continues with this case where you're not allowed to tell the truth. And when you're not allowed to tell the truth, Jeff, I get very suspicious and very nervous uh, and I'm, I'm starting to believe the truth is far, far, far different than even what I thought it was at the beginning of this crusade. Uh, and, and again, I, I just, this is the most amazing story I've ever even 
conceived of, and I, I, I wish that people fully understood what did and did not happen here and, and what the real nature of the evidence is. John, one of the things that concerns me is that it's not only that you can't tell the truth, it's that you can't pursue the truth in, in some of these cases. And it's one of the things, going way back in this case, when the authorities first came out, and I'm forgetting now if it was, I, I'm forgetting who it was. I, I want to say the Attorney General, but I might be wrong on that. But somebody came out and said, listen, we want you to know here in Pennsylvania, if, uh, you t if you're a child and you tell us somebody abused you, we'll believe you. Well, I don't, I don't think that should be the message. I think it should be we will definitely check it out and find out whether or not you're telling the truth. But to tell somebody that, well, no, if you say you're abused, then you were abused. And that was the message from Pennsylvania, I, I just, again, yes, if you were abused, we would, I do want you to be heard, and I want the uh, case to be pursued, but I don't want it to be, and that's, again, that was the exact words, was, well, if you tell us that you were abused, we'll believe you. Well, I, don't, I want you to investigate it, I want you to find out, right. and yes, I want there to be severe consequences if there was abuse but even with the you know the repressed memory therapy stuff john even the the folks that say that that is a real thing and i don't know i i mean i'm, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert enough to know one way or the other but even those that say that uh, that it is something that you can do it's not something that you do in your early teens and then five years later, uh, unless it is a really traumatic event. Well, and and well, I look, just look, let, me, let me be very clear, Jeff. I agree yep. with everything you just said, but but here's the thing: I'm not basing um, the fact that Matt Sandusky is a liar simply on the fact that he testified under oath. And by the way, never testified that he was abused. Uh, I think that's important. It ought to be in the movie. It is not in the movie. And I think that's extraordinarily uh, important to, to point out, and I think it destroys the credibility of the movie. Because let's face it, by, under the best case scenario, Matt Sandusky is an admitted perjurer who, because he says his abuse ended in 1993, and, and obviously was an adult well into this period of time where Jerry Sandusky was still allegedly getting away with abusing kids, that you could argue that it was his cowardice and lack of coming forward forward that made these kids vulnerable. That's the best case scenario for Matt Sandusky, and yet he's being made into a hero. I think that, that there's no question that we have seen an unprecedented, unprecedented level of, of the unwillingness to even consider this, I mean, the other side of this case. I mean, in the history of notorious cases, I mean, you're allowed to say that um, Martians killed JFK. You're allowed to say that O.J. Simpson is innocent. Um, you're allowed to say that 9-11 was an inside job. But you're not even allowed to question the conventional wisdom about Jerry Sandusky's crimes uh, or alleged crimes, what I, as I'm now referring to them, because after having met with Jerry and Dottie most recently in prison, I have grave, grave questions about whether there's any consciousness of guilt here, anywhere near required uh, for the narrative that has been created here to be remotely plausible. Uh, and, and so, to me, it's, it's, almost like, uh, it's almost like Holocaust denial in Europe, where it's illegal, it's literally illegal to even question the Holocaust. I'm not making, someone's going to say, oh, Ziegler's questioning the Holocaust. No, what I'm saying is that that's not a healthy uh, situation, and that the trial, the trial of Jerry Sandusky, we now know, was a sham. It was a complete sham, and regardless of your view of his guilt or innocence, uh, people ought to be horrified by what transpired here, and it was all because of fear, the fear that you just articulated, the fear of being seen as being hard on the victims. Well, we went way too far on this pendulum in the other direction, and when Matt Sandusky is the star of a major movie, you know that's the case because people in State College know what Matt Sandusky is really all about, and the evidence is overwhelming that he is not telling me the truth. It's, and it's clear, and I've written about it at FramingPaterno.com. John, you, you've obviously seen the, the movie in its entirety, the finished product. Well, I have not, actually. I've oh. not seen the finished product. I have talked, though, to several people who have seen the, the finished product, and I've written, I've read numerous reviews of this, and I've talked to many people who were interviewed for the film. So I feel very confident that what I've written about, uh, and having spoken to the producers of you know, many times. I'm very confident that what I've written about is based in the reality of the final version, yes. 
because I, I very much want to see the movie just to, because I, the, I kind of thought I had a pretty good inkling of the direction the movie was taking when I saw Matt Sandusky was going to be featured so prominently. How do you explain, I know you touched on this in your uh, your piece, but but how do you explain the Paternos' uh, yeah. endorsement, basically, well, of this I, film? I've had a uh, rather extraordinary and contentious uh, about 15 to 20 email exchange with Scott Paterno, whose decision it was uh, to, to participate in this film, I'm sure, with, along with Sue and with Jay. Uh, as you well know, Jeff, um, Scott and I have had a rather contentious relationship publicly. Uh, I, I believe that Scott has made numerous mistakes from a PR standpoint. I think this is par for the course here. What I think happened was uh, that Scott Paterno decided n not to participate in some other projects, which he thought might be perceived as too small time or too pro uh, Paterno, which sounds crazy, but that's the way that Scott thinks because he wants you know to be able to go into the mainstream, which is understandable. I think that's actually you know not the craziest idea in the world, except for the fact that in this story they have no leverage. For, so so for instance. Uh, you know, Scott and Jay and Sue all participate in this movie, and then their participation gets dwarfed by Matt Sandusky and Andrew Shubin, his attorney. Well, Scott has no leverage to then say, wait a minute, this is not what we signed up for, because no one in the media is, gonna, is going to take the side of the Paterno family uh, in this case. So Scott, I guess, didn't think it through. Uh, I warned him. I specifically warned him about the people making this movie, because I had met with them, I said, as I said, on, on multiple occasions. The, the person who runs the, the company that did this movie, Asylum Entertainment, named Jonathan Koch, is a former Second Mile counselor, believe it or not, and actually a former huge Penn State and Paterno fan, which I think worked against the Paterno family here because they had no cover. They had to have a Matt Sandusky. Otherwise, they would have gotten crushed in the news media as, oh, my gosh, is this some sort of paternal apologist? And that's why this other person I referred to, a major figure in the story, I believe got edited out because I think they were afraid of being seen as too Penn State, too pro-Penn State and too Joe Paterno, pro-Joe Paterno. But the fact that the Paterno family used Sue Paterno's only interview in a major movie to be dwarfed as, a pen, as essentially a vehicle for Matt Sandusky, who is, in my view, a lying scumbag and maybe the worst person in this entire saga, uh, is just par for the course for this entire in, in, insane-making case. Yeah, I'm, I'm, we are going to work to get Chip Minnemeyer in here. I, I know Chip. I like Chip a lot. But I, I reading through the email exchange, I, I think he is just... Uh, fearful of exactly what you said, of, of being portrayed as uh, as a news organization, of being too hard on a victim uh, or victims of sexual abuse. And well, hold on a second, Jeff. It's important, and I understand you know this, but it's important to understand, Matt Sandusky is in a different category uh, because Matt Sandusky, first of all, made his name known. He is now making himself a celebrity, showing up at the premiere of a major movie uh, with a Cheshire Cat grin on the red carpet, speaking at the movie, and he took millions of dollars from Penn State when he had no damn right to be claiming Penn State had anything to do with his alleged abuse, which did, which did not happen. So he is not in the same category as these other victims. He made himself a public figure here, and that's why I believe um, it, it's wrong to protect him from the basic facts of this case, which are overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly indicative that he's not telling the truth. John, I talk a little bit about Andrew Shubin's role in in all of this because I, I think it's uh, it's pretty fascinating too, and I've been told. Uh, kind of off the record, that there was some fear from Penn State officials of what Shubin could do in the the courtroom, and and basically you you have I think a university running scared uh, because of uh, lawyers' tactics and uh, ultimately costing the, the university millions and millions of dollars. You're exactly right, I, and I told the makers of this Happy Valley movie, you had the real story here right in your lap. 
you had Matt Sandusky, you had Andrew Shubin, you had Scott Paterno, and you had a couple other people who I think, if you knew what the right questions to ask were, would have been the basis for telling the real truth of the story. Andrew Shubin represented, by his own account, nine different victims of some level in this case, but he also represented Matt Sandusky. He's a major force in this movie, and he also represented, and this is important, victim number two, the Mike McQuery victim, after the victim number two had come forward to Joe Amendola's office on the day Joe Paterno was fired and given a very extraordinarily strong statement saying that he's the boy in the shower episode, nothing ever happened, Mike McQuery is not telling the truth. Well, Andrew Shubin happened to uh, also represent victim number two in not one but two DUI cases uh, right around the same period of time, and uh, victim number two's mother used to work for Andrew Shubin. And it is very, very clear to me that Andrew Shubin coerced victim number two, convinced him that his relationship with Jerry, while not abuse in the classic definition of it, as people think about it in this case, was enough to qualify as abuse. And since he did not have a job, he does not have a, currently have a driver's license, he's going to school currently at Lock Haven University, uh, I believe he convinced him, hey, look, you don't have to lie, you don't have to testify, uh, you, the, the prosecution doesn't like your version of events, uh, you're not going to put Jerry, your friend, in prison, uh, but you're going to get paid some money here and you'll never have to talk about it publicly. And oh, by the way, that's why they settled among the very first cases. If that man, uh, victim number two, had not had really changed his story, I mean, he's the McQuery victim, he would have milked Penn State for every single dollar possible. His Philadelphia law firm that Shubin referred him to, Ross Feller Casey, would have had Penn State by the balls. Well, that didn't happen. And the reason it didn't happen is because victim two didn't change his story. He was not abused in the shower that night. I'm positive of it. And yet, <laughs> the thing goes on. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, the thing goes on with Penn State willingly allowing it to go on. I, I guess well, they, that but, still but, remains but, the frustration. People don't understand. The number one thing people don't understand about this case is that so many of the key entities have perverse self-interests. This case is upside down. I've come to believe that this case is like a mural, Jeff, and that most people, since we know a mural played a huge role in the perception of this story, Michael Pilato's mural, I think most people are looking at this mural from maybe a foot, two feet away, and they're not seeing the full mural. Because of the people I've spoken to, I'm looking at this thing from 15, 20 feet away, and now I understand, Jeff, you're actually supposed to look at the mural upside down because everything about this story is upside down, and Penn State has a perverse incentive and has had since November 9th or maybe even 8th or 7th of 2011 to embrace their own guilt here. It's bizarre, but that's the reality of it, and uh, that's why most people don't understand what really happened here and what did not happen here. But the ironic thing is, John, I, I think a large part of why Penn State embraced its guilt was the, the whole move on mantra, and let's get this behind us, and yet here's victim six suing and saying, I want yeah. the records, and Penn State's fighting that to the, uh, the nth degree, records I, which I, they I, have I already you, released. I agree. I, am, I, <laughs> I think I have a pretty good handle on just about every aspect of this case. I am baffled by what's going on in Victim 6 case with Penn State actually fighting it and Victim 6 not taking a settlement. Victim 6 has by far, by far, the worst case of any of those trial uh, victims, certainly the original trial victims. Yeah. Um, I mean, he testified that nothing happened. It was in fully investigated, and it was determined to be unfounded. Uh, I, I mean, if you read his testimony, uh, as I'm sure you, you're familiar with it, Jeff, I think victim six reads like a, 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 um, a witness for the defense in the yeah. Jerry Sandusky trial. Uh, and yet somehow they're fighting this to the nth degree, and Penn State for some reason is not caving, which, which tells you something is up here. There's no question about that. John, what, what did you learn? Uh, did you learn anything new, I guess, in your, your recent uh, interview with, with Jerry and Dottie? Yes, I did, Jeff. Um, the first time I interviewed Jerry in prison last year for three and a half hours and then went on the Today Show with Matt Lauer to discuss it, my goal was to figure out, okay, is there any chance that Joe Paterno and Penn State really knew about this? Was there any sort of cover-up? What really happened here? And, I, and we talked a lot about the McQuarrie episode, and, and, but it was not mostly not about Jerry. Because I, I presumed at that point that Jerry must be some level of guilty. Well, in the years since then, 
learning more about the case, learning about what really, really did not did and did not happen, I began to have grave questions about the nature of his guilt. I've talked to you about this both on and off the air before. Yeah. And so I wanted to talk to him and Dottie together to find out whether or not my questions are valid and whether or not there's this case deserves another look because the trial was a sham. And i got to tell you, and I can go into great detail about this, and I'm sure I will with a, with a, with a, video, with a video that I'm going to create at FramingPaterno.com soon. They'll go into you know, enormous detail about why I believe this. But I now am, I've come to the conclusion, Jeff, that Jerry Sandusky does not have anywhere near the level of consciousness of guilt, nor does Dottie have any consciousness of guilt whatsoever, required for the current monster narrative about him to be even remotely plausible because he's not an insane person, and he knows right from wrong. And I, I believe that that was the number one thing that I was able to prove to myself, that there, was, there is no consciousness of guilt here. And by the way, I don't think there's ever been consciousness of guilt in any element of this story, uh, certainly not from the Penn State and Joe Paterno perspective, yeah. which I think uh, is incredibly important to understand here. I, it is. I just, <laughs> sadly, John, yeah. I, don't think, I, I don't think very many people uh, are are ever going to understand that. I don't think I they're interested yeah, in, in get, learning look, that. I, I'm a realist. I get that no one wants to believe. The funny part about this is I get that no one wants to believe me, even though what I'm telling you is actually fantastic news, that there's a darn good chance that there was not nearly the damage done here as has been perceived. You would think people would embrace that. But I'll say one other thing, Jeff, and I think you'll agree with me on this. Maybe you won't. Deep down, especially in state college, there are a lot of people who do agree with me. In fact, there's a lot of people very, very close to this case who, who agree with me. It's just completely verboten to say it. And I'm now about the only person in the position and stupid enough to actually tell the truth here. Uh, but when you talk to people privately, I hear this all the time. You know what, John? I agree with you. I just don't want to say it publicly because there's just too much damage done. There's too much fear. Fear and cowardice ran this whole story from day one, and the truth got lost. And an injustice, I think, even greater than I first realized, has probably been done here. Yeah, I still, I mean, at the end of the day, I'm honestly, I'm not sure <laughs> what I think anymore. I, I'm really not. John, how do you answer? Because I have had uh, some uh, friends of mine have, have said, well, you know, every time Ziegler says he talked to Sandusky, he just loses credibility because you're taking the, the word of a liar. And I keep, I, I keep coming back with, well, how, if you're trying to get to the bottom of the story, whether you think Sandusky's a liar or not, how do you tell the entire story without talking? It'd be like, telling the entire Charles Manson story without ever talking to Charles Manson. I mean, you, I, I don't understand how talking to the individual at the center of this right. in and of right. itself, and that's what these people will yeah. say to me. That It's like, well, no, you, you dismiss right. everything that Ziegler does because he talked to Sandusky, and I just, oh. for the life of me, I cannot, I just don't understand the rationale well, there. I agree with that. Unfortunately, Scott Paterno has, has promoted that view uh, for what I believe to be extraordinarily selfish purposes. Let me tell you a real quick story about what happened in prison. Uh, I asked Jerry and Dottie, what was the first moment that they realized that they were in big trouble, that this thing was not going to turn out right, that it was not going to be okay? And the reason I asked this question of both of them was because I wanted to figure out, okay, if, if Jerry is remotely as guilty as people think, uh, that, that moment's going to come real soon in the process, right? I mean, if you, if, at least it, it, in your subconscious or even your conscious mind. Right. Well, the reality is, that when I asked this question, both Jerry and Dottie answered the exact same way at the exact same time. And with a tear rolling down his cheek where he couldn't even brush it aside because his hands are so tightly together in handcuffs, Jerry Sandusky articulated in great detail how it was the moment that the verdicts were read was the first time that he realized that this was not going to turn out okay, that justice was not going to be done. And he went into great detail about how he almost blacked out, can't hardly remember what happened after he heard the first few verdicts of guilty. And Dottie said exactly the same thing with tears 
streaming down her cheeks, fighting the tears so hard that she had to leave the room. It was zero, zero doubt in my mind that this was a truthful answer, one that could not have been contrived. And just to make 100% sure, I then called Joe Amendola when I got back home, and Joe had no idea what I had asked her, had any contact with Jerry or Dottie. And I said, Joe, based upon your experience, what do you think their answer was? And he thought for two or three seconds, and he said, was it the reading of the verdicts? And I said, yes, it was. And I'm telling you, Jeff, I'm positive of this. You can believe he's a liar. You can't believe he's the greatest manipulator, actor, uh, along with Dottie in the history of the world. They can't both be these incredible scheming manipulator puppeteers and also make some of the mistakes they've made, like not being able to answer it simple damn question about whether you're sexually attracted to young boys on the phone to Bob Costas. It just doesn't add up. He doesn't believe he did anything wrong. I'm positive of that. Now, is there is there a good chance that there's some gray area here as to what his boundaries were and what actually happened? Absolutely. And do I know exactly for sure what did and did not happen here? No one does because the trial stunk to high heaven. This was a sham, and we're never going to know the full truth here, but the notion that I'm talking to the people who are most involved in the case uh, destroys my credibility, that to me shows you're afraid of the truth here, because that makes no damn sense. John, as always, we appreciate the time. We are flat out of time. Uh, look forward to talking to you again in the near future. Thanks, Jeff. And the uh, website, framingpaterno.com. Just about